Uh, thank everybody for coming. Um, I've been asked to um, uh, be here today uh, as the um, sort of the, the silver-tongued glad hand without any real technical knowledge here. And, I, and I've come for two reasons. One, because uh, uh, Maya Van Rossen asked me to come, and uh, she is the uh, Delaware Riverkeeper, head of the Delaware Riverkeeper Network, and uh, one of the most committed environmentalists I know, and just a tireless advocate for the Delaware River and environmental issues generally. And uh, so if she asked me to be part of this, I know it's important. And then the second reason is just the importance of uh, uh, buffer issues generally. Uh, this is an issue that um, comes before the legislature from time to time, efforts to compromise uh, uh, stream buffers. Um, and although this presentation is going to be totally neutral, totally agnostic on legislative issues, there is legislation currently working through the legislature now relating to um, buffers. So it's an enormously important issue. It's a, it's a, it's a uh, topical issue. And um, I was uh, told that um, I don't want to get into the weeds on the buffer issue. I thought that was a little pun, uh, into the weeds on the buffer <laughs> issue. So I won't. Let me just thank the, uh, the sponsors of this and let the people who know their stuff um, get on. The sponsors of this are the Delaware Riverkeeper Network, my, as we mentioned, uh, Clean Water Action, American Rivers, Penn Future, and Pennsylvania Campaign for Clean Water. We have a good lineup of speakers. Uh, I won't take up any more of their time, and uh, I'll let Maya do the uh, rest of the introductions. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Representative Vitalik, for that wonderful introduction. I am Maya Van Rossum. I'm the Delaware Riverkeeper, and I want to welcome you. And I'm just up here to introduce our, our first speaker and to let you know that we're going to have our speakers go first. And then after each of our speakers has made their presentations, we'll bring them back up for any questions and answers um, that you may have. We're going to start with uh, Dr. Byrne Sweeney. Dr. Sweeney is the director of the Stroud Water Research Center. Um, Stroud is one of our nation's leading research organizations that is focused on the health of our freshwater systems. They are a leader regionally, and they are a leader, leader nationally for freshwater ecosystems and on this issue of riparian buffers and their many important values for our communities. So Byrne. Thanks, Maya. And uh, I'll try to keep this non-technical, but to the point. Um, next slide. Uh, so we're going to talk about streamside forest buffers, but I want to I want to give a little background and perspective to 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 let you know how important this subject is for everyone in this room. Next slide. I want to remind everybody that the uh, the Clean Water Act of 1972 called for uh, us to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's water. So that was the purpose of the Clean Water Act. Next slide. I also want to remind you that this is a picture of a, uh, a graph in the latest EPA report on the health of the nation's waterways. This came out a few months ago. And they evaluate the health of the nation's waterways based on all the streams and rivers that are represented by dots in this, in this graph. Um, next slide. The report is not good. Okay, the upper left-hand pie chart here shows that 55, you can't read it, but 55% of the streams and rivers were red, and that is they're in poor condition. 23.2% uh, of the nation's rivers are in only fair condition, and only a small percentage are in what we would call good condition. In the east, eastern part of the country, where we're at right now, it's even worse than that. 62.7% of the streams in the east, including Pennsylvania, are in general in poor condition. Next slide. What does it mean to be in poor condition? Well, it means that the, sw the, 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 the stream or river is no longer swimmable or fishable or um, appropriate for directly using for other kind of human activities. And to the, to the plants and animals that live in the stream, it means that many of them have been extirpated. And so for a stream in poor condition in Pennsylvania, it means that 70% of the species that normally live there, whether they be plants or animals, are now gone. They've been eliminated by the, the degradation of the water quality. Uh, I don't know about you, but if, if, if I woke up in my neighborhood and found out that 70% of the, of the residents moved out, I would think that something's wrong with the neighborhood. Well, something's wrong with the neighborhood here. Something's wrong with our streams. Next slide. So how are we doing with respect to the quality of water across 
the nation's, uh, uh, the, the continent of the United States. Next slide. We're coming up short. And short is not good, not only in the fashion world, but it's not good when it comes to providing sustainable source of clean, fresh water to our current generation, our future generations. We can't afford to come up short. Next slide. The root of the problem is us. Everyone in this room, everyone is living in Pennsylvania, everyone living in the United States, everyone living in the world. Uh, next slide. Lots of us. So by the year 2025, eight and a half billion people living on this planet. Now, we don't have billions of people living in Pennsylvania, but we have millions of people living in, plant, in Pennsylvania. And guess what? The people in Pennsylvania are no different than the people elsewhere in the world. Every individual living in Pennsylvania needs a little piece of the watershed uh, for three different things that, that are very important in their lives. The first part is, next slide, is that they need a piece of the watershed for their housing. So what's happened in Pennsylvania is that what was historically Penn's Woods, where every square foot almost of Pennsylvania was one big old growth forest and you could drink the water out of streams, we have been eliminating very sequentially over the last 300 years that forest to make room for these different pieces of the watershed that we need to use. Next slide. So we need pieces of watershed. Each of us need a piece of the watershed for our housing, okay? So whether we live in a housing development like this or where we're living on a farm like this, we need a chunk of the watershed for that housing. Next slide. We need a piece of the watershed to do our business, whether we're working in the state capitol building like we are now, or a high-rise building in Philadelphia, or at an Amish sawmill. We need a little piece of the watershed to be cleared to do that business. Next slide. We also, the third thing is we need a piece of the watershed to, to grow our food, right? And so whether we're growing the food on a corporate farm like this or whether we're growing it on a Mennonite or an Amish farm like this, we need land and cleared land to grow that food. Next slide. So what we've been doing for 300 years has been gradually trading forest, pens, woods, next slide, for space for human activities. And that's okay because it's okay. We're, we're occupying the space. We need to have space. We need to grow our food, have our business, and so on and so forth. But I can tell you from, as a scientist that whenever we trade forest for something other than forest in a watershed, water quality in the streams and rivers coming out of that watershed declines. That's a fact. There are, I could show you graphs, I can tell you technical problem, uh, papers on that. It's a fact. Next slide. So here's the burning question. Here's the, here's the question that we're sitting around a table today. Can we use all this land for all these things I just talked about housing, business, and food, and still have clean, fresh water available for humans and for wildlife. Next slide. I say the answer is yes. And that's not because I'm an optimist. I'm a scientist. But we have the technology to do this. We just have, we, we need the wherewithal to apply that technology. Next slide. It's pretty simple. The most, the most effective and fundamental thing we can do is just create a little space between the things that we're doing and the things that we're trying to protect. And in this case, in this room today, it's water and water quality. Next slide. This is a photograph of Bern Sweeney's hand running Bern Sweeney's power saw, okay? And the question I ask you is, this is, well, I, I propose to you this is a very dangerous piece of equipment. This is the dangerous part of this thing, right? The saw blade. This thing can cut my finger off in a split second. And I asked you this question. How is it possible for Bern Sweeney, a scientist, not a carpenter, to use this piece of equipment for three or four hours straight on a Saturday morning and not cut my fingers off? It's built into the design of the equipment, right? So we put a little bit of space between the dangerous thing that we're doing and what we're trying to protect. In this case, a couple of inches, right? But we also put something in that space that makes that, safe, that space even more effective. In this case, it's steel. So a little bit of space between a dangerous thing and what I'm trying to protect and some steel in that space. Next slide. The same thing applies to the kind of things that humans are doing out on this landscape. So in this case, we're growing corn, right? So here is the dangerous 
activity that humans are doing. Here's what we're trying to protect, the water in the stream. Why? Because if you go 12 miles down from this point, this water goes into the city of Newark as drinking water. Now, many of you might say this is not a dangerous activity, right? Growing corn, what's so dangerous about growing corn? Well, we put chemicals on that corn, we put fertilizer in that corn, and if I were to take a gallon jug that's sitting on this table right here and fill it with, say, atrazine, which is widely used on corn, and offered everybody in this room a $500 bill to anyone who would sit there and drink that gallon of water, nobody would do it. Why? Because you know you're going to die. Because that chemical is unsafe. But we have to make sure that that chemical doesn't make its way down into the drinking water of the people that are downstream from us, right? So this is not enough space between this dangerous activity and what we're trying to protect in order to assure that that bad stuff doesn't get in there, that we don't harm the public. Next space. So what we need to do is create a buffer. A buffer is just a space between what we're trying to do, either grow corn or have a housing development or have cattle or whatever, have an industrial complex, and what we're trying to protect, the stream. So it's just moving that activity back a little bit and putting something in there that will add protection. For the power salt with steel, in this case, it's trees. Trees are the best thing we can put in that space, and I'll tell you why in a few minutes. Next. So what is a streamside buffer? What is a streamside forest buffer? Next slide. It's a best management practice for keeping stuff out of streams. So stuff is this great word that in this context means pharmaceuticals, pesticides, fertilizers, things that are, you know, grease, oil, things that are related to human activities that are washing towards our streams. So we need to keep that stuff out of there. So that's the general definition of a streamside forest buffer that I think everybody around this room would probably embrace. Next slide. Wrong. Because that's only part of it. That's only half of it. Maybe it's not even completely half of it. Okay, so keeping stuff out of streams is only half of it. Next slide. We want to keep stuff out of streams with a buffer and we want to improve the health of the stream itself so that it can process pollutants for us. So we want to keep the stuff out, and we want to put the stream in a position to process things that are going to get into it, because things will get into it. Next slide. I want to show you two case studies, that both of which were done in Pennsylvania, to convince you that this is not something, some science that's being done elsewhere in the United States and maybe isn't appropriate for our state. So these are two case studies in Pennsylvania to prove this point. Next, next slide. So the first one is this aspect of keeping stuff out of streams. Can a buffer keep things out of streams? So this is a study that Stroud started back in 1990, okay? At that time, there was a corn field that was, and the corn was being grown all the way down to the edge of a stream. We moved the corn up slope 100 feet. We planted the corn field in trees, 18 inch seedlings, and we let the trees grow up into a forest. And we studied what happened to the chemicals that move off of this corn field towards that stream over the next 20 years. Next slide. And by the way, that this, this has been published in the technical papers in the back of the room. Here are the average results after 18 years of that study. Nitrogen, which is one of the major polluters in, in the continental United States and in Pennsylvania, Chesapeake Bay in particular, 26% removal of the nitrogen that was putting on those fields by that simple little space of trees. Sediment, suspended sediments, 43% removal on average by this this buffer. Next slide. So this is a good news, bad news story, right? So if 26% of the nitrogen is being removed, what does that mean? Well, that's good, but it means that 74% of the nitrogen is still getting into the stream. This is why we talk about the other side of buffers, that we need to stream to be able to process stuff also. 43% of the sediment is re being removed, but 57% is still getting in. Okay, it's a good news, bad news story. Next slide. So the conclusion based on that work a couple of years ago was that no matter how good the best management practice is on the landscape, we're not going to be able to keep everything from getting into the stream. So we need the stream itself to act as a, sort of the second line of defense for keeping things and stuff from going down and getting into our drinking water systems and into our, uh, our wildlife uh, areas. Next slide. So case study number two addresses this other aspect of buffers, and that is 
can the forest buffer itself actually help a stream more effectively and efficiently process pollutants? And the answer, of course, is yes. I'm going to, and so this is a study we did a couple of years ago on the southeastern part of, the United, uh, of Pennsylvania. 18 streams selected at random. Uh, we took advantage of the fact that Penn's Woods is no longer a Penn's Wood. It, it no longer stretches from Pittsburgh all the way to Philadelphia as one big forest. It, it exists as patches of forest. And so, so what Pennsylvania looks like in a lot of areas are little patches of forest on the landscape. And the streams flow into a patch, out of a patch, into a patch, out of a patch. So what we did was we went in and said, OK, how does the quality of this stream look right here, where there are no trees along it, versus right here, where there is a bank of forest on either side? Same amount of water for all practical purposes, because we're only talking about a couple hundred yards distance here. Same water chemistry, no trees with trees. What does that tell us? Next slide. It told us a bunch of things. One, it told us that when you have trees on the banks of a stream, the stream is much more stable. The banks of the stream will not slough into the water when it rains and, and the water levels rise. And so this is a much more stable condition than this. These banks will, will um, fall into the stream and the sediment will wash downstream with almost every rainstorm. Next slide. We also learned that when a stream is forested, the channel is much wider than when the stream is deforested. So the stream, like in this case, is 18 feet wide. 100 yards upstream from this point where there is no trees, the stream is only one yard wide. The stream is narrow. And you say to yourself, what difference does that make? Who cares if a stream's wide or narrow? Well, when a stream's wide, it has more bottom area per unit length. And the bottom of the stream is where we process pollutants. And so the more bottom area you have in these small streams, the more pollutants you're going to process. Next slide. The third point we learned from this comparison was that forested streams, if they're shaded by trees, have a much more natural temperature pattern. And that means that they can support the native plants and animals that are supposed to be in our streams in Pennsylvania. Because Pennsylvania streams were historically forested and cool for, their, for 10,000 years. It's only the last 300 years that we've removed the trees and, and warmed them up. Next slide. The fourth point we make is that forested streams are shaded and they grow better algae. The kind of food that's available in a stream ecosystem affects how well it can process stuff. How well the nutrition is of the workers in this Capitol building dictates how well they're going to work. It's the same thing happens in stream ecosystems. Next slide. The last point is that forested streams receive a lot of leaf litter from the overhanging canopy, and that's good. That's food material, provides a healthy stream. All these points add up to a conclusion. Next slide. Conclusion that when you have trees on the banks of a stream, the ecosystem, the plants, the animals, the, bun the fungi, the bacteria, are in a much healthier and a more, much more vibrant condition and can process stuff that gets in them. And that stuff are pharmaceuticals, agrochemicals, all kinds of toxic materials. Stream ecosystems can process that stuff, that stuff if it's healthy. Next slide. So how wide does this streamside forest buffer need to be? This is like the burning question, right? How wide from the stream do we need to go out with this forest? Next slide. Well, a colleague of mine, Dennis Newbold, and myself just finished a, an exhaustive literature review on this subject. We looked at over 500 scientific studies. Half of them we had to throw out because they were poorly designed or poorly executed. But half of them, in fact, 238 were, were valid studies, and we reviewed them. Next slide. And, that, and they've been pub they are going to be published. They've been accepted for publication in a peer-reviewed journal. That journal is coming out in two months. There's six copies of this manuscript in the back of the room uh, that's going to be in print in, within two months. 238 scientific studies reviewed, eight factors that we looked at. Nitrate removal effectiveness, sediment trapping efficiency of the buffer, stream width optimization, channel erosion protection, temperature control, woody habitat, macroinvertebrate health, and fish health. All those are in the paper. All the studies that exist today that bear on how wide a buffer needs to protect those things are in that paper. Next slide. This is the 
quote from the abstract. It's the last sentence of the abstract, and it says, this is the concluding statement, overall, buffers greater or equal than 30 meters, which is 100 feet wide, are needed to protect the physical, chemical, and biological integrity of small streams. 100 feet wide is what the, at least 100 feet wide. Next slide. Greater than or equal to 30 meters or 100 feet wide means equal to or greater than. It doesn't mean less than. So the, the science is saying we need 100 feet or more to adequately protect our small streams and rivers. Next slide. So one row of trees along this, this is a small stream in Pennsylvania, one row of trees on either side of that, of that small stream is not a streamside forest buffer. It helps. It's certainly better than no trees, but it's not what the science is saying we need as a, as a streamside forest buffer. Next slide. I want to remind you one final point before I close. 100 feet is the minimum, right? When the engineers designed this building that we're in today, they figured out the strength of materials that were needed to support this structure, and then they doubled it. Doubling the strength of materials used for a structure is sort of standard engineering practice. It's a safety factor that they build in because they do not want this building to collapse and kill people. So they double the strength of the materials. Next slide. So I say to you, I just told you that this water, 12 miles downstream, goes in as an intake pipe to provide all the citizens of Newcastle County, Delaware, with drinking water. Next slide. So I say to you, for the greater public good, the engineers have not been allowed to cut corners in designing these buildings because they don't want to harm the public. But for some reason, we have constantly been cutting corners on this back aspect of public safety. We're always saying, oh, the science is saying 100 feet, but what can we get away with? How about 35 feet? How about 50 feet? What we should be saying is, oh, the science is saying 100 feet, let's build a safety factor in. Let's make it 150 feet. Let's make it 200 feet. Thank you for listening. Patty talked about the economic values of open space from a flood mitigation perspective, and I just saw it from maybe from the science perspective um, and how streams function. And you could talk a little bit about how they, all of us, handle increased flooding, flood seats, flood damages. A um, streamside forest buffer can play a major role in trying to attenuate flooding downstream um, in a number of different ways. One is that when you create, when you create a um, a, when you remove the, the, the land adjacent to a stream from agriculture or from other uh, human activities and plant trees, you basically start converting land that's highly compacted and highly prone to running the water off to land that is now becoming more organically rich and becomes more like a sponge and is able to infiltrate either rainwater directly or surface runoff that's heading towards it. And so when you create the buffer, you're creating a zone of um, much better soils, much better infiltration capacity. So what you do is you, you try to channel the stormwater runoff from upslope down. You try to even it out with a, with a grassy sort of transition zone and then let it flow directly into a riper riparian forest buffer where it will infiltrate. Now, of course, if it's a huge storm, some of it's going to continue on. But that's where the, the buffer can play another role. And that is that as the buffer grows up, the trees grow up, they start shedding large woody debris into the stream. And the presence of large woody debris in streams, tree trunks, big tree limbs, and that sort of thing, that infrastructure greatly slows down the, the rate of movement, the velocity of the water during a storm event. So basically, it, it keeps the storm water in the upstream uh, headwater tributaries and preventing it from rapidly moving downstream and causing downstream floodings. And the last part is that I mentioned in my talk that when you plant trees next to a stream that's been historically deforested, you almost immediately, as the trees grow up, start expanding the width of that stream channel. And as you expand the width of the stream channel, the stream is still conveying the same amount of water, the water velocity slows down. And so the, the peak flood water slows down as it moves downstream. So basically wider streams, Street wide streams of woody debris keep 
um, flood waters more in the headwaters and keep them from moving down stream to the large rivers. So it plays a, a tremendous role in, in attenuating peak floods. And just for, for Byrne, um, I've heard suggestions that um, when you're talking about water quality benefits of, of um, water quality benefits to streams or flooding issues or ecological habitat issues, that you really can have a choice between a buffer and or doing something up the hill, perhaps to deal with water quality issues associated with stormwater runoff. And just when people frame it as a choice between buffers or some other activity up the hill, how do you respond to that? I always say that, that in order to um, mitigate um, stormwater runoff and flooding and so on and so forth, that it's a, um, it, it's a concerted effort, it's sort of a, a, it's a, it's a, it's a concerted effort between several best management practices. And so streamside forest buffer is one, terracing is another, grass waterways are another, um, rain gardens are another, and so on and so forth. Um, and when the question comes up as to, well, which one is more important, or which one can we eliminate, I often say that, well, it's like saying, well, which, which leg of a four-legged stool do you eliminate? Which one's the most important and which one can be eliminated? And the fact of the matter is you can't eliminate any of them. You need, it's a system. You need an integrated system to be effective. And so basically, am I here saying that a streamside forest buffer is all you need to do? And if you put a buffer in, then you don't need to worry about everything you do uphill? No. And if you put something uphill, do you need to worry? You say, okay, we put something uphill, we don't need to put a streamside forest buffer in? No. Basically, you need to have the system in place, and it's the system that's going to be most effective in, in doing this. And so um, we, we, uh, the science says that you need all those things to be going forward in a, in a, in a unified and concerted way. Again, I want to thank Representative Vitale for his wonderful leadership in helping to set today up, as well as our sponsoring organizations, the Delaware Riverkeeper Network, Clean Water Action, American Rivers, Penn Future, and the um, Campaign for Clean Water, Pennsylvania's Campaign for Clean Water. So thank you all so very much. And thank you for, for coming. And I hope you'll take the packet of materials because it includes some of the science from each of our speakers as well as some additional information that could be helpful to you. Thank you.